Thank you, Mark, and um, I hope you all had a very Merry Christmas and wish you a Happy New Year as well. And because we are looking toward the new year and we're having this special service, we have taken a break from our studies in 1 Thessalonians. We'll be back in that next week, but I thought we would do a passage that I think has a new year aspect to it. Mark read from Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 3, and I'm going to begin with verse 7, and we will read through verse 11. The main verses I'm going to look at, though, are verses 9, 10, and 11. But Paul begins in verse 7, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time in it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. At the end of the play, Richard III The hunchback king is about to meet his doom on the battlefield. Standing alone, he cries out, A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. He would give up everything, all that he had schemed and murdered to get to escape and save his life. It fits Satan's slander, skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. Is that true? Probably for most people it is. It wasn't for, though, the Apostle Paul. In Philippians 3, he speaks of giving up his kingdom, which was Judaism. Not for his life, but for Christ. Really, what he gave up was his life. In order that, as he says in verse 8, I may gain Christ. In earlier verses, he described both his pedigree as a Jew and his accomplishments in his religion. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee, a law keeper, a zealot. We know from other passages that he was a rising star in Judaism, trained under the leading rabbi of the day, Gamaliel, on his track to be appointed to the great court, the Sanhedrin, if he wasn't a member of that already. But all of that changed when he met Christ on the Damascus Road. That's when Paul saw himself as he truly was, not as a righteous man, but as a self-righteous man, as a sinner. Suddenly, he says, everything that he thought was gain, his heritage as a pure Jew, his personal achievements in the law, all of that, he came to realize was loss. Rubbish, he said. It did nothing to gain God's approval. That's when he turned from self-reliance and confidence in himself, in his own abilities, in the flesh, to confidence in Christ and trusted in Him for salvation. And he now develops that in verses 9 through 11. He describes it in three aspects of salvation, the past act of salvation, the present activity of salvation, and the future goal of salvation, or justification, sanctification, and glorification. And at the center of all of this was Paul's personal pursuit of his goal. To know Christ. Nothing was more important to him than that. Better, Paul would say, to have Christ and nothing than to keep everything without Christ. 
So he gave it all up, he says in verse 9, gave up his sense of worthiness, his position in the synagogue, the prestige that he had among the people. So he could be found in Christ, could be joined to Jesus in a personal relationship. He couldn't hold on to his self-righteousness and have Christ too. He said in verse 9, his acceptability with God was not because of his own righteousness by law keeping, but because of the righteousness which he received, which comes from God. An alien righteousness, not something self-produced. Now, this is one of Paul's favorite subjects, this subject of righteousness. And it's one of the most important subjects in the Bible. It's all about justification. That's a word from the law courts. We have an excellent, I think, illustration of what justification means in Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 1, where Moses gave instruction to the judges of Israel. He told them to be fair, not crooked. Don't exonerate the guilty and condemn the innocent. He told the judges to justify the innocent and condemn the guilty. And what that means is you can't, it doesn't mean don't, it doesn't mean make them innocent, you can't do that. What he's saying is declare them to be what they are, innocent. And frequently when Paul uses the word righteousness, it's used in that sense, it's used with a legal meaning, not of doing righteousness or of God making someone righteous, but having a righteousness or right standing with the law, being Right with God, being in a position, a status of being righteous or innocent with God. That's the meaning here. It has the idea of being acquitted in court, of being declared not guilty by the judge. And it is a free gift of grace because the reality is we are all by nature guilty, not innocent. Paul indicates the freeness of it when he says, not a righteousness derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. We have this right standing, this position of innocence and righteousness through faith, not by works. We don't earn it by good deeds of law keeping. We receive it by believing in Christ. Now, when I say our righteousness is a free gift, I mean it is free to us. It's not free to God. It cost him a lot. He, ha he, he can declare us to be righteous and he can declare us to be forgiven because his son in our place paid for it all. He paid the full penalty of our sins in his death. And by his perfect life established the positive righteousness of full obedience to the law. That righteousness is put to us through faith and through faith alone. And to stress that faith is the only way to receive forgiveness and have Christ's righteousness, Paul says, it comes from God on the basis of faith. That's the gospel. We do nothing to earn our salvation or to secure it for ourselves. God in Christ does it all. Christ is our Savior. And that truth moved Paul greatly. It filled him with love for Christ. Maybe he had that great experience of love for Christ and appreciation for what he did because of his past experience. I'm sure that did add greatly to it. He had lived his life on the treadmill of religion that got him nowhere, working for a righteousness and acceptance with God that, that, did, that accomplished nothing. And so when he realizes that Christ has done it all, that filled him with gratitude and love. So much so that more than anything else in life, he wanted to know Christ and know him better. And so in verse 10, he states his goal in life, which was to do that to know Christ. It is not to know about Him. It is to know Him. Know Him personally. 
He wants a growing relationship with Christ who died for him, which indicates that the one who died is now alive. We can't have a relationship with a dead person. Jesus was raised from the dead. He, uh, he, we have a living Savior. He's with us daily, really with us, through the Spirit of God, and with us constantly. He told His disciples at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That means He's with us now. Paul was very much aware of that. He had met Him at midday on the Damascus Road, saw Him in His glory, listened to Him as He spoke. He knew He was alive. He knew Him. And His goal was to know Him even better. And that's to be the goal of each of us. In fact, that is what eternal life is. Well, eternal life is many things, but the essence of it is knowing the Lord. That's what Jesus Himself said in John chapter 17 and verse 3. Eternal life is knowing God and Jesus Christ whom He sent. And so Paul's ambition should be our ambition. Making it that is a, a good New Year's resolution. If there is such a thing as a good New Year's resolution, we tend to break those, but this certainly should be the goal of our life every day of every year, to know Christ. Christ has saved us for fellowship, saved us for a relationship, and we are to desire that above all else. That makes sense. Things are nice, but relationships are better. You may have received a lot of things this past week. I hope you did. I received this tie, <laughs> which I like very much. If you don't like it, don't tell me because it's from my daughter and son-in-law. Um, I like it, but I like my relationship with her and with him better. And with my daughter, uh, other daughter, and grandchildren, and, gra and, and, and sons-in-law, relationships are far better than things. And we have the greatest relationship, we who are believers in Jesus Christ. We know God Almighty, and knowing Him is better than anything, and to know Him better is to be our great ambition in life. Now, of course, to do that, to know Him, we need to know about Him. It's foolish to talk about knowing a person without knowing about the person. And so knowing Christ involves study. It involves a serious study of Scripture. So it's a good idea to get one of those uh, pamphlets in the back and start reading through the Bible this year. Uh, we need to know the Scriptures. That's the revelation of God. And so knowing Him involves being taught, it involves uh, fellowship with the saints, it involves a whole host of things. Attending church, coming to the Lord's Supper, all of these things. No one was more faithful in these things than the Apostle Paul himself. No one knew doctrine better than Paul. I read a book, or I'm reading a book, it was written in the early 20th century, by a theologian who was not really evangelical, but he makes interesting points at the beginning of his book and a kind of assessment of the day, of, what the, of the, the spirit of the age in which he was living. And I thought how much like our own day this is, how there's a, a, a disparagement of doctrine and theology and how, how people will begin to speak about that, and people are appalled, not appalled, but are, are put off a bit by theology and doctrine. And he made the point that we must preach the theology and the doctrine of the Word of God, or we're preaching nothing. And that's certainly true. That's what we need. We know, need to know and devote ourselves to the things of God. And as I say, no one was more faithful in these things than the Apostle Paul himself. No one knew doctrine better than the Apostle Paul. And the more he knew that, and the more he knew about Christ, the more he knew Christ, and the more he wanted to then know Christ. It fed upon itself and produced a greater desire to know Him 
whom to know is life eternal and of whom there's no end to knowing. Nothing was, Im- was more important to him and nothing is more important to Christ. He wants us to know him. Luke 10 is a passage well known to all of us and that it's the example I think of that when Jesus visits the uh, home of Lazarus and of course you know the story and Lazarus had two sisters Mary and Martha and Martha was a worker and she rushed around the house trying to get the meal together and Luke writes she was distracted with all her preparations Mary on the other hand was no help at all she went into the room where the Lord was teaching and she sat down at his feet. Now as you picture the scene, your heart goes out to Martha. It doesn't seem fair. Mary should have been in there helping her sister. Martha thought so and she complained to the Lord. But Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. But only a few things are necessary, really only one, for Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. The one thing that is necessary is listening to him, getting to know him, and Mary had chosen it. We do have our responsibilities in life, earning a living providing for ourselves and our families, getting an education, taking care of the children, managing the house, and the list goes on. The Lord wants us to be good workmen, diligent in whatever we do. But we need perspective. We all need perspective. What the Lord desires from us above all things, even above Christian service, is learning about Him, getting to know Him, That desire pleases Christ. It was the heart of the psalmist who wrote in Psalm 42, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for Thee, O God. Pants for Thee. Pants pants for the Lord God. Paul's did as well. He longed to know Christ more. It is in Christ, he says, in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 3, that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. Now think of that. In knowing Him, we gain wisdom. In knowing Him, we gain knowledge. We gain the greatest things in life in knowing Him. And Paul wanted to find those treasures, to have them, and to be like Him. That's what we do. That's what he did, Paul. And and that's what we do with those that we admire. We not only want to know those we, we admire, we want to emulate them. We want to be like them. That's really true of people of all ages. You see it, though, particularly with young people, young boys. They want to be like their favorite ball player. In my day, it was swing the bat like Mickey Mantle or catch the ball like Willie Mays. They want to be like their hero. With Paul, it wasn't athletes, it was Christ. Our great God and Savior, as he describes him in Titus 2.13. He wanted to be like him to experience his life, his resurrection life. That I may know Him, he says, and the power of His resurrection, which is the greatest power there is. Power over death. Dunamis is the Greek word for power, and it's from dunamis that we get such words as dynamic and dynamite. Bible teachers like to illustrate the greatness of this resurrection power that we have in us with our relationship with Christ by saying things like it is the dynamite that destroys sin and makes room for personal holiness. Obviously Paul wasn't thinking of dynamite but he he was thinking of a force as great or greater than that, one that breaks the power of sin, one that liberates us from old habits and transforms lives from bad or even mediocre to good and to great. 
It takes the power of God to do that. We can't produce that of ourselves. We can't produce that in our own strength, not naturally. The power of sin is too great. The power of sin is great in our own lives as believers in Jesus Christ. Paul knew that. He spoke of it, wrote of it in Romans chapter 7, for the good that I wish I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. Well, that's the struggle we have in the Christian life, but we're not left unaided. We have the power of Christ. Christ who conquered sin on the cross and was raised from the dead. He enables us to conquer the failures in our lives and to conquer the sin that's in us, the bad habits that we have, and guarantees our ultimate victory. Now that's the life of the Christian. It's the struggle. It's a battle. And Paul puts it in those terms. Like a struggle of an athlete, the, 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 the fight of a, of a soldier, that's the Christian life. But the ultimate victory is ours in Christ. Now, this must have been especially meaning to the Philippians, to whom Paul wrote this letter when he speaks of power. Because they knew power. Philippi was a very Roman town, a military outpost, and Rome was the very embodiment of power. The Roman army had conquered the world. Paul was reminded of Rome's power every day because as a prisoner in Rome, he was chained to a Roman guard, a Roman soldier. And as a prisoner in a Roman jail, awaiting Roman justice, he was reminded every day of their great power and prestige. And yet, Paul writes to this small group of Christians in this little town, this military outpost in Philippi, and he says, the real power in this world is not in Rome. It's not in Caesar or in his legions. It's in Christ, and Christ is in us. We have the power, he was saying, and I want to experience it in a, a changed life that triumphs over sin, in a godly life, in a bold life that stands for Christ. That's what I seek in life. That's what Paul was saying. And, and that's what we're to seek. David told Solomon, Know the God of your father. If you seek him, <clears throat> he will let you find him. And if we seek Him, we will find Him. And all of the, the wisdom and knowledge and power that are hidden in Him that, that can give a new life to a troubled marriage or bring order to a disorderly life, give us real perspective in life, that's a, that's a promise. So Paul sought Christ because he wanted to know Him and experience His power. And he says he wanted to know the fellowship of His sufferings. Now that seems to be an odd statement, but there's a logic to that. Because the more we are, are like Christ, the more we are transformed by His power, and the more we will repeat His experiences in our own life. And Paul wished to be so identified with Christ to represent him so closely in this world that he suffered the same reproach from the world, the, the, the same persecution due to righteousness. And he did. That was the life of an apostle. I've made references, I think, uh, more than once in our studies in 1 Thessalonians to Acts chapter 5, the, uh, the, past, the past few Sundays, where Luke records the initial reactions and, uh, uh, against the success of the gospel in Jerusalem because it, it took hold on the day of Pentecost and it just began to spread. And as the apostles preached, people were being brought to faith. God was adding to their numbers day by day, the text says. So to stop this, Peter and John were arrested for preaching in the temple 
Uh, they warned them not to do it again, and just to make their point very strongly, they had them flogged, beaten, and then warned them again before being released. But Luke writes, when they were released, they went on their way rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And they continued preaching Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ. That's not easy, of course, rejoicing after receiving a flogging. Even Timothy shied away from it, and so Paul had to remind him in 2 Timothy 3, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The world's not going to want to see righteousness in our lives. It's not going to want to hear about righteousness from us. And if they do, they will react to that. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And there's another kind of suffering as well, because the more we become like Christ in this sinful world, the more sin will afflict us. That is, the more it will grieve us. That was part of what our Lord suffered. He entered this world from an eternity in heavenly bliss with His Father. In the beginning was the Word. And he was with the Father for all eternity, living in perfection and glory. And he entered into this fallen place, this sinful world, this madhouse. And the ugliness of sin grieved him. It afflicted him. And it should us. So Paul says he wants to be conformed to his death, meaning he wants the effects, that is the blessings of Christ's death for him to become an increasing reality, a daily reality in Him. Paul had been crucified with Christ. All believers have been crucified with Christ. Paul tells us that in Galatians 2.20 when he represented us. He's our representative. He stood in our place in judgment on the cross. There our old person died in his death. And so we died to sin. And all of that became our possession at the moment of faith. He states all of this in Romans 6, and then in Romans 6, verse 11, he applies it by instructing us to act on that reality. Understand that it's true, and then act upon it. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. That's who you are, and act upon that. That's what Paul is expressing here. His desire to daily conform to his new life in Christ to daily die to sin, to selfishness, and follow Christ as His servant. Be His servant in this world. The key to the Christian life is recognizing who we are in Christ. That we are now new creatures. We are forgiven completely. The Lord God has justified us because of what Christ has done, and we've joined ourselves to Him through faith, and he has declared us righteous. We are totally, completely, and forever accepted by Him. We can never be more accepted by Him than we are at the moment of faith. We don't need to be trying to gain His approval. We have His complete approval at the moment of faith. And we can never be shaken from that. That is our status with Him. That's our position with Him. And the reality within our life is that we have been put to death in regard to sin in the world. We're dead to that, dead to its power. We now have power over it. doesn't mean that the power of sin is not within our lives. Sin is there, and we have to deal with it. But we have divine power to deal with it. And we're to be living like that. We're to be acting upon that. That's how Paul wanted to live. That's what's involved in knowing Christ. It is a life-transforming relationship, a real relationship that changes us and transforms us and makes us better and more faithful. But the complete transformation is still future with the resurrection, when both sin and its effects will be forever removed, body and soul. There will be healing. There will be glory. Paul longed for that. 
He says in, in verse 11, that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. The New, Amer the New International Version has, and so somehow to attain to it. Both of those translations seem to convey a, a hint of doubt in the apostle. Paul had no doubt that he would be resurrected, but he expresses his hope here with uh, an, attitude, an attitude of humility to indicate that it is all by the goodness and grace of God. He had no confidence in himself. It was all in the Lord. From beginning to end, it's all of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. But God is faithful to His promises, always faithful to His promises. And resurrection is our future hope. And when we speak of Christian hope, we speak of certainty. That's our hope. Glory to come. Perfection. So in three verses, Paul sets forth three Great doctrines, justification in verse 9, sanctification in verse 10, and glorification in verse 11. They are all inextricably connected. Justification is the basis of sanctification. And it leads to sanctification inevitably. Sanctification, though, is complete ultimately in glorification in the resurrection, which is our great hope. A hope that should be in our thoughts, in our minds, because it reminds us that, that this life is but a brief moment of time. All eternity is yet before us. Today, in this brief moment that we have, is the time, is the day of labor. It's the time of service. The rest, though, is still to come the time when we cease those labors and we enter into the Sabbath rest, heaven, the world to come. And so we should ask ourselves, what are we doing? What are our ambitions? What, what goals are we pursuing in this, as I say, brief time that God has given us on this earth? A life without ambition, without goals, is an aimless life, a, a tragic life. But ambition only for the things of this life and not the next is an even more tragic life. And not a very satisfying one either. So what's your ambition? To make a lot of money, have leisure time and a comfortable retirement? Those are not bad things. Those are good things. I, I hope you have all of it, and I hope you have prosperity, and then don't feel guilty about it. But the greatest thing is to know Christ and to know Him increasingly. This is what the Word of God says. Knowing Him, that should be our ambition. That is a life of fulfillment. That is a transforming life. It, it makes us productive in the best things and prepares us for eternity. Jesus got to the heart of it when he asked, What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? No one's ever gained the whole world. But taking that as the ultimate, and of course it would be the ultimate in terms of materialism and human ambition, gaining everything there is. How many men have come and gone who've tried to become rulers of the world and have always failed? But if you could do that, have all of that, have everything you want in this life that's like a blink of the eye, a vapor without Christ... That's vanity. Well, believers can't lose their souls, but we can lose out on the best when we live for time and neglect eternity, when we neglect Christ. We will come to the end and realize that uh, we have little to show for our life. Mr. Spurgeon used to warn his congregation of that and urge them to to live for Christ so that when they come to the end, 
their death pillow will not be stuffed with thorns of regret. So as we begin this new year of 2020, let us resolve to make it our ambition to know Christ, to invest time and effort into learning about Him, praying to the Lord God, entering into that kind of personal communion and fellowship and living for Him daily. That will produce a fruitful, well-lived life that is a blessing to others and a blessing to ourselves. That's the good life. That's what the Word of God tells us. But first, you must know Him as your Savior. Do you? Or are you Mr. Legality, a keeper of the law, a person who has tried to live a good life, a moral life, and, and you hope it's good enough? And maybe you think it is good enough. It's not. That's a treadmill. It gets you nowhere. Paul was that man until he realized all of that. And he lived a good life. He lived a moral life. He lived a very religious life. All of that, he realized, was but rubbish. It doesn't save. Only Christ saves by His death in our place. So repudiate your own righteousness and seek Christ's. Trust in Him. Lay hold of His death by faith and believe in Him. Trust in Him. The moment you do, you are received with forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. You can never lose that. You can only develop in it. May God help us to do that. May that be our resolve as we look at the new year and live out this next year for him. Well, we're now going to take the Lord's Supper. I'm going to close in a word of prayer before that, and then we'll sing a hymn. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we do thank you for your goodness to us and the life that you've given us in your Son. We thank you for him, for his death. We thank you for the word that you have given us in Philippians from the Apostle, his great ambition. Lord, make that our ambition, to know you, to know Christ. And in knowing him is to know the Godhead, the triune God. May that be our ambition, Father. Uh, we recognize we're debtors to mercy alone. We, we can only do things ultimately by your grace, Put that within our hearts. Give us that ambition, we pray. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.